are here in the beautiful Black Hall Manor, where Keen O'Connor has invited us to talk about all his previous successes and his plans for the future. Keen, if we start at the very beginning, you started show jumping a little bit later than some people might have. Tell us a little bit how you got into show jumping. You know, my father was hunting, my dad Tig had a, had a very good hunter called Radiman when I was about 14, 15 and uh, I would have, my first memory of competitions would have been with him uh, doing local mini midi maxi competitions. Initially dad kept the horse in, um, in Bettystown County Me, the John Floody stable and uh, I would have competed up there and gone on beach rides with John and cross country so basically I got into it kind of as, a, as, a, as an all rounder before I went into show jumping. Okay, I didn't realise that your dad rode. Yeah, yeah, as a hobby. Yeah, he loved hunting. And uh, I can remember from my transition year from school, I, I hunted twice a week. Uh, so uh, I don't know, did the, did the Jesuits know at the time? But uh, it was certainly a good education. You can you meet a lot of all, all, all different kinds of characters on the hunting field. My dad was a great support. And uh, as I said, dad was hunting. And, and through that, I suppose I got into horses and started hunter trialling, as I said. And that gave me the, the urge for, to be competitive. And it was from, from then I wanted to go into show jumping. Um, I was very fortunate early on to, to meet Jerry Mullins. When I was in, uh, I, I lived in Johnstown near Nace and I used to go and watch the, the show in Kill on a Wednesday. And I used to see Jerry there and he was a uh, really, really tough trainer and uh, teaching everybody from the sidelines and, and very vocal. And I really liked the way he was so enthusiastic. And I went up to him one day and asked him, you know, how could I get lessons from him? And, and, and so I put myself out there. And he was very kind. He, he, he brought me to another place where he was teaching and uh, he watched me riding. And, uh, you know, he didn't know who I was from Adam and he just helped me out. I was, he was, I was a guy that he met at the show. So that was certainly very good. And, and Jerry's still a great friend and mentor yeah. to me today. But early on in my career, I was certainly very, very, very lucky and, and I'm very grateful uh, to my godfather, uh, Tony Riley, who, who certainly helped with the purchase of horses. And for my first 10 years, I mean, horses like... Um, and Normandy and Waterford Crystal uh, were a horse that really put me on the map and no different than somebody now coming through that talented someone like Bertram Allen. Yeah. I mean without good horses you, you're only another number and uh, you know it's great to be able to have have the the background and to have the support to be able to have those good horses because uh, good horses make good jockeys. How has life changed for you since the London Olympics? It was great. I mean, um, to to build up to London and for it to go so well was 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 fantastic. And you know, not only for me, but there were so many other people involved mm -hmm. who, who helped make it happen. It was it was great for everyone to get a bit of a kick out of it. And uh, how life has changed, I suppose you can. We all can take a little bow and say, you know, that was job well done. You know, myself and my team. And. Uh, when you're younger, you're, you're, you're kind of kicking for more and, and you want more all the time. And for sure, I have major goals. Mm -hmm. But to be the first uh, Irish person to bring back an equestrian medal was a big feat. And, and uh, sometimes, you know, when you have a major result, you can just take a step back and enjoy it. And I think that's what we did. Absolutely. And when you were at the Olympics, there was a stage when we thought you weren't going to make the final. But I've heard from numerous people that you always took it that you would be in the final. How did you say stay so positive? I mean, most people would have been at their most devastated at that stage. Sure. Well, after the after the middle qualifier, we were one place out. It was three people on on equal thirty sixth. Uh, myself, Jose Larocca, mm -hmm. and Dirk de Meersman. And uh, so, if one dropped out, the three yeah. of us actually would have got in. And um, you mean the chances of one dropping out were probably quite high. I thought, mm -hmm. uh, in in terms of horses had to be healthy, and and uh, there was another veterinary inspection to go through. So as you know, it was the, really the eleventh hour. The, uh, one, one of the mm -hmm. final horses to jog up was uh, Ralph Corn Bankson's, and 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 it, it wasn't a hundred percent. So we got the nod at the last minute, but um, you know you've got to be prepared and planned and focused. And uh, it was amazing when you look back on it how it all fell into place. You then sold Blue Lloyd to uh, Nikki and Barbara Walker, but you maintained the ride. To an extent, you still competed in the Nations Cup team with them. How did that all happen? Well, I was contacted by um, by uh, Frank Stronach, 
uh, who's uh, the grandfather of Nicky, and he wanted to buy a, a Grand Prix horse uh, for his granddaughter. And uh, he, he flew to Ireland and he came and he, he met me and he checked out Blue Lloyd. And uh, one caveat of the deal going through was that I would come to Florida to, to help her become accustomed to the horse. Mm -hmm. And uh, that developed into, into uh, Nikki getting on very well with the horse and then coming to Europe to train. And uh, now she's got four horses and they're based here for the winter. Mm -hmm. And then I'll bring them to, uh, to Palm Beach in, uh, in January. And, uh, help manage her operation there in Wellington. Okay. Um, so kindly Nikki and, and her mum Belinda, you know, allowed me to, to compete the horse uh, at St. Gallen this year. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then again in Dublin, Nikki wasn't using the horse till Mill Street and okay. uh, they kindly let it happen there. It was really, really good of them, I mean, to, to for them to have a horse at that level and allow it to be used for the Irish team twice this year was, yeah. was pretty special and I think everyone's very appreciative of it. Um, there's no doubt that you still have a great partnership with Blue Lloyd after the win in the Grand Prix. Did you find it hard, I suppose, to get back up on Blue Lloyd when he was maybe used to Nicky to an extent or how, how did that partnership work? Well, it was normally something like that would be very unusual and it wouldn't, mm -hmm. wouldn't, ha wouldn't be, 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 that, be that common but mm -hmm. the difference here I suppose is that Blue Lloyd never really left my care. So even when he was in the States, he was under my staff. I was flatting him okay. every day, uh, the same regime, the same program. Okay. So everything, I was basically managing the horse and Nikki was then competing him. So even this summer, uh, I would have been working him for her uh, five okay. days a week uh, and not really jumping him so much. That just shows you the, that a lot of the horses maybe are, don't need a lot mm -hmm. of the amount of jumping that they get. I mean, if you take it that he probably didn't jump a meter 50 Oxer in over 12 months. Wow. And then, uh, you know, the week before Dublin Horse Show, I took him to Coilogue and jumped him in a 135. Okay. And that was my prep. Yeah. And then he went in and he jumped the, the 145 the first day and then the Aga Can. And he was yeah. just, just, he nicked a rail there. He was a bit unlucky and then just came right for the Grand Prix. Mm. So obviously, the more experienced the horses are, they don't need that much jumping. But um, I suppose by, by being able to train her on the horse, uh, and not have put the horse under a lot of pressure throughout the year. Mm -hmm. Nicky's competing him at 140, 145 level okay. and riding him really well, doing yeah. a very good job with him. Uh, you know, if she wasn't, he wouldn't be able to do what he did. So it's also a testament to her good work and the work that she's done with him throughout the year. And then the Grand Prix um, in Dublin. You were first, off, first in in the jump off, which usually puts people at a disadvantage to an extent. Sure. But like that was a remarkable round. How did you plan it? Like the precision in that round when you come away and you have to go into a jump off, how do you plan your jump off round? So most major classes like that, you'd walk the jump off when you're walking the first round. Okay. I would anyway, and you take note of, of what strides you could do and, and, and where you could be quick. And um, there was a line uh, from the fifth fence, the oxer in front of the, the, the grandstand, with, was it like a seven and a half strides down to a double. Mm -hmm. And I just reckoned that the seven was gonna be too flat there. And I said, I'm gonna do eight. And everyone after me tried to do seven and didn't get away with it. Mm -hmm. So I think that was a that was a big help. Also, Blue Lloyd's very neat and, and economical. He's a thoroughbred type horse. Mm -hmm. And when you see him cutting the turns without much uh, encouragement from me, he doesn't look that fast. But if you study some of the other people and where they were, they, you know, the, only the really quick ones were just a second quicker, mm -hmm. taking all the chances. So we probably were quicker than we looked, mm -hmm. and it was certainly enough to put a bit of pressure on. Keen, in show jumping, you're mainly competing individually. And then there are some events like the Nations Cup, um, WEG, or various team events. How does that differ for you? Obviously, you always want to do the best you can. But when you're riding on a team, do you find there's more pressure or do you find a difference? Um, I think some people maybe thrive on the team pressure. Mm -hmm. And by being coached by Jerry initially, um, it's been the ethos to put the focus on the team. That was what he instilled into all of us at an early stage. I mean, Jerry took us off on the B team when I was 20, and uh, he and myself and, and some of the army riders, and he really, the focus was always the cup. And because that was put into you at such an early stage, it's still very much the, the ethos. And, and uh, I think it would be for most riders. I think it's very important. If you turn up at a show like, like Dublin Horse Show, where there's maybe 16 classes, you're, you, you need to focus your horse towards the Nations Cup. I mean, and that includes not galloping him the day before. Yeah. I haven't seen a horse yet where that will help them go well in the Nations Cup. So it's about being really focused and serious about the big day. Otherwise, there's no point in going on the team. I mean, at the end of the week, you know, there's two classes people are going to talk about. It's the Nations mm -hmm. Cup and the Grand Prix. And you really need to put all your eggs in, 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 in focusing for that. If that's the road you want to go, and if not, 
If not, that's fine. But uh, I mean, I've jumped on I think 94 Nations Cups to date. I know the stats because we were doing some work on my website recently. And uh, that's something I'm very proud of. And hopefully Absolutely. there's a few more left to come. Definitely. <laughs> you mentioned there about thriving under pressure. Um, I'm not sure, would you agree with the statement that you definitely thrive under pressure? Going from the Olympics alone, that must have been, like, there was so much pressure. And you seemed to, to probably, you know, you gave Blue Lloyd the ride of his life. Okay. Yeah, I suppose I suppose I do. I'm, I'm probably quite focused and, and, and when it's really important, I'm maybe a little bit cold. I don't get too excited. Okay. And uh, I think that helps. And also to be accurate, you know, we're jumping those big fences. You know, you can't run deep, you can't mm -hmm. make a mistake. And you have to be so diligent with your course walk and your warm up, you know, not to not to upset things. So many people get excited in the practice arena. These are mistakes I would have made when I was younger. I can remember Tommy Wade giving out to me for jumping too big outside with water for crystal right. and driving the horse mad and then and then having him upset for going into the arena. So these are things you learn as your career progresses. But I think Nations Cups makes mentally tough, cool riders okay. because you have to perform and deliver that Friday at three o'clock is the time to jump a clear round. If you're jumping for yourself, you can go have two down in the Grand Prix, you can pack up, go home and go to the next show mm -hmm. and no one knows about it. Yeah. The Nations Cups, the eyes of the world are on you. And, uh, you know, I've had some good Nations Cups and some bad ones. And from the bad ones, you learn how to how to go better. So the, the team jumping is really what, what I suppose develops uh, mental strength and concentration that allows you to be able to, it's not just that you're good under pressure, what what makes you good under pressure? I think that has made me and other riders uh, like Billy Toomey, Dermot Lennon, guys who yeah. have a track record of delivering on the big day. And you mentioned there, you know, highs and lows. Like with horses, there is so many low points, really. Obviously, there definitely is highs, but how do you deal with the lows? We talked about the last two seasons, you know, you've had an incredible two seasons, but it hasn't always been that easy. How did you deal with the low points? Yeah, I suppose I tend not to, not, not to get too high or too low. I mean, okay. um, after I won the Grand Prix in Dublin, we went for dinner and we enjoyed it and, and uh, we can relax and, and you know, uh, give ourselves a pat on the back for it. But I don't go wild when I win and equally, if I go badly, I tend to maybe get up earlier the next day and try and analyze it and try and try and go over my mind where it went wrong and then move on. I mean, that's the great thing about sport. There's always there's always the next day. Yeah. And um, I mean, it's important to, to stay somewhat normal. And, and, and uh, you know, nowadays they have sports psychology and so on, which mm -hmm. which which serves, serves, serves its place and, and has its purpose. But I think sometimes people maybe don't want to, you know, compartmentalize things and own up to their own shortcomings or where they went wrong and they want to they want to make things out to be so complicated I mean you know if you go badly yeah. you analyze it you see where you went wrong you didn't have your horse produced correctly maybe you hadn't enough flat work done or he wasn't jumping well enough or he was sore or you just didn't ride properly uh, I mean fitness is a is a big part of it as well mm -hmm. it's something that I sometimes have to work on a little more uh, I don't drink or smoke but uh, I'm fond of my uh, my grub, okay. and uh, it's it's something. So hope, hopefully, hopefully, I can I can work on that. And as you get older, it is it is being serious. It is it is something that's important. And uh, you mentioned Abbottstown. Yes. Uh, that's an area that that um, they have a gym and a facility there. So I plan to use that over the winter as well. But in 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 terms of. Uh, you know, it's been important to be able to analyze and be self-critical without driving yourself mad. Yeah. You know what I mean? I've seen, I, I know people who are, who they'd be in a straitjacket, that they're so hard yes. on themselves when it goes badly. And people that I help, I suppose coaching has taught me as well how to be able to, to deal with my own uh, mm -hmm. ups and downs because you see other people getting so frustrated. And yeah. uh, it's important just to stay level because you really will drive yourself mad. And, and for sure you can learn from your mistakes, but move on. And uh, I think if you're critical and, and, and able to analyze, you're the best sports coach for yourself. Uh, yeah. For me, that's that's how I like to see it anyway. When it comes to selling horses, I know you sell an awful lot of horses, but is it difficult to sell a horse like Blue Lloyd, who's done so much, you know, for your career and like the Olympics? Was that a difficult decision? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's hard to part with good horses. I mean, you'll only meet so many in your lifetime, probably. Yeah. Um, but you know, we have to we have to survive as well. And I was very fortunate that the people who came in to help me. Uh, purchased a horse initially, uh, did that. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I wouldn't have had the opportunities or the success that I had. And you have to respect that, and you have to be prepared to 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 honour the agreement, which is you know, 
if we buy a horse in a, in a, in a syndicate mm -hmm. and I do my job and produce the horse to a high level, that then when the day comes, I'm prepared to sell him too. So that's the agreement in which I enter into and you have to honour that. You say that you get the same buzz out of a competition as you do selling horses. Explain that a little bit to me. Yeah, I enjoy dealing. I suppose my father was, was, uh, was a car dealer and uh, when I was growing up, I always understood the, you know, the idea of buy for X and, and sell for X mm -hmm. plus a little more. And, uh, you know, for me, it's all about, I love being on the Irish team. I love being, it's, it's an honour to ride, to ride in the team and I really enjoy being a part of it. And, you know, if you have a major sponsor, you can do 52 shows a year, you can be on the road week in, week out. But to be honest, even if I had that, I don't know is that something I really would enjoy. Mm -hmm. I quite like the way I do it, where I attack certain major targets throughout a year and try and try and deliver on the big day. Uh, you bring horses to a level, uh, by not over jumping them really helps the horse's longevity and mm -hmm. keeps them sound, which obviously helps when you when you want to sell them. So uh, I don't sell lots of horses. Uh, the market, the middle market is uh, is poor. I mean, when 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 I was, you know, seven, eight years ago, a lot of Celtic Tiger money, we used to sell maybe 30, 35 horses a year. Um, people from Dublin who rode as a hobby, the, mm -hmm. the daughters or the wives from business people were riding. And that market has kind of stopped for me. So basically we concentrate on smaller numbers and higher quality okay. so that uh, you, you really aim for the, for the, for the, the top class horse. La last year I bought a very good uh, uh, six-year-old uh, gelding called Gainline. Mm -hmm. And um, in the last 12 months he did maybe probably only uh, 11 shows, 11, 12 shows. He won one competition, the championship in the Global Tour in Shanti, and then he was sold uh, the week after Mill Street. So I suppose it's a proof of that sometimes the production, sometimes we get carried away here at home with galloping against the clock and mm -hmm. doing a little bit too much with them as young horses. And I don't think it helps towards either producing them for future competition or for sale. So I think that's something that needs to be looked at perhaps. The other thing I wanted to mention was you have a new horse now, Cooper that you think an awful lot of. Yeah. Tell me about him and will he be aimed at Rio or is that a little bit too far out? So Cooper, I bought Cooper last year, or this year, I bought Cooper this uh, this spring uh, with the aim of building him towards World Equestrian Games. I mean, it's, it's um, we have, as always, great talent and Robert Splain always said that this was going to be a learning year in, in that, you know, this wasn't a qualifier for the Olympics, mm -hmm. this year's European Championships and this was a chance to test all of us and see see where we were at and um, with the World Equestrian Games you know only 11 months away it's it's something that we really need to take stock and think how we're going to go well there because ultimately there's no point talking about Rio if we don't go well in WEG we need to be thinking about how we can win a medal a medal in WEG if we want to seriously yeah. be considered for Rio first of all for qualification but secondly there's no point going anywhere to make up the numbers who want to want to go and deliver so with that in mind I put together a syndicate to buy Cooper He's a nine-year-old horse. Mm -hmm. He only did 145s, a lot of 140s before I got him, and a couple of 145s. So he's maybe a little bit greener than I thought. He jumped a couple of very good rounds at Aachen uh, in two big classes there. He was clear in the big class in Dublin the first day. So he's done some, some really good things. And I just decided after Dublin just to drop him back a bit and to, to take my time with him over this winter and build him up, hopefully, say, for the Nations Cup in Florida. That would be my next, my next goal. And my main aim with him would be would be would be the World Equestrian Games. But I'm always trying to give myself options. Um, I got a new horse last week who jumped at the European Championships in Herning, a horse called Carola Z, uh, that was ridden there by a Finnish boy. And uh, I've got big plans for him too. It'll certainly help Cooper because it'll take the pressure off yeah. that I won't have to jump Cooper in every big class. So Carolus can and, and Cooper can balance it out. And I've got one or two other things in the pipeline that might come off before the end of the year. So, I mean, as you know yourself, the, the level that we compete at, you need horses can get a knock or lose mm -hmm. form. So if you have three Grand Prix horses, you've certainly a good chance of, of turning up. And um, I mean, there are very good riders and very good ring riders, but championship level is is a, is a serious step and there's probably only a half a dozen of us who have a lot of experience at championship level but it's trying to get those riders mm -hmm. horsed up at the right time and being able to deliver so hopefully everyone is focused on on, on trying to do it um i know robert's Blaine certainly is and uh, if the riders can get it together with the with the right horses um and as we saw with the british team this year i mean it's not necessarily for superstar horses is needed yeah. if you have 
you know, two good ones and two medium ones and you make their plan accordingly. Mm -hmm. I think that's sometimes where we can get caught out is we get dictated to what shows we go to by the by the prize schedule or by the, by the ranking points and you end up going from show to show to mm -hmm. show and the horses lose form. So I think that's something that we all need to look at and say, how can we really plan to get to the championship and peak peak level? Maybe that means peaking, you know, in June, yeah. backing off your horse for a little while and going again. And uh, that's something that's very important is not just to travel around willy nilly. Yeah. If you were to give advice to young riders coming up, what percentage would you say is business and what side is like riding ability? Sure. I mean, it's hard to give advice to anybody, yeah. but I mean, the one thing you'd say is that whatever you do, try and do it well. Okay. You know, uh, attention to detail is so important and that's not a phrase that should be used loosely, I suppose. What do you mean by that? You know, being organised, being structured, being very presentable, neat and tidy in terms of your horse, yourself, your tack, your truck. You know, very basic things okay. for somebody, you know, having their own stable because by doing the, oper the operation well and by 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 looking uh, organised, that attracts people. People want to be involved with people who are successful as opposed to someone who's disorganised or untidy. Mm. And, and I suppose that's the very first step and as to how, how to, what image you want to portray. And when you've organised that and you have a, it's hard because you need staff and you need people yeah. and, and it's hard to have the wherewithal to do everything, but it, it's, uh, it's pretty fundamental that if you're, you have to attract people to you. And, and, and that starts with, with, with how you conduct yourself. And there might be a lot of people out there that might have an awful lot of, say, natural ability, riding ability, but without the horses, there's not much they can do. Absolutely, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a fact. And, and, you know, they have been forced to go away and to, 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 uh, to train and to, to learn. But, you know, a lot of people have made it that way. Mm -hmm. And uh, where, the, where there's a will, there's a way. I know it's, it isn't easy, but people find their niche. And there's many aspects of this industry. I mean, not everyone aspires or is capable of jumping on Aga Khan or, or going to a championship, mm -hmm. but there's loads of different ways through the coaching, uh, through all the various parts within the industry where people can earn a really good living. I mean, it's, 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 at the, at the, it's one of the few sports where people are still, you know, spending money at a very high end. Mm -hmm. So it, it is positive from that point of view. yard is actually only a few minutes down the road so you're very lucky and um, at the minute how many horses do you have in? Yeah, we have 18 horses uh, at Carlswood. I have a barn with 10 horses that myself and Ross Mulholland ride and then the other barn is eight horses and that's mainly uh, client horses. We have four horses there from Nikki, and then uh, four other customers as well. And how many staff do you have? We have about uh, nine full-time staff okay. so I have a girl in the office full-time and uh, and then each of the riders has a has a groom. Um, I have a new groom uh, this year, a boy called Matt. He's excellent, uh, Frenchie, who you know runs the operation and manages everything a little bit for myself and for Nikki. Uh, Nikki has a groom. Ross has a groom. And then we have another head girl at home and uh, a guy that takes care of the yard and and all that goes with that. So yeah, it's a it's a big team and and we're probably more staff than most, mm -hmm. but. To do it well and to do it the way we, we want to do it, the horses go out of the stable three or four times a day. Um, you know, between lunging, turnout, hacking, or riding, uh, we have a spa there as well. They go into a spa after they've been jumping. Um, you know, they get very well looked after, so it's a high-end care for them. And for that, you need plenty of people. Yeah, and of course, you have another breeding operation in Kilkenny. Um, tell me a bit about that. Yeah, together with Andrew Hughes, I've probably forty horses there as well. Uh, younger horses and um, it's something that Andrew really looks after it's his baby and he takes really good care he does a good job and over the last couple of years I've taken some of the horses up to Carlswood and developed them okay. and uh, we, we have we have we tend to try and sell them to keep to keep the operation uh, cleaning its own face and, yeah. and, and to make it break even we tend to to try and bring them on and sell them I've won very good for you all this mm -hmm. year which uh, I think is exciting and and uh, sometimes we outsource those horses to other people okay. because bringing the four-year-olds to us is a different job altogether. They need so much time, mm -hmm. you need more staff. So I've given them to various riders around Ireland. Okay. And um, we had a foal actually this year uh, out of Echo Beach by Pacino. I saw a picture of that yeah, foal, I think. Yeah, yeah. So that'll be cool, that'll be interesting. Has It certainly has a chance of being a jumper anyway. Yeah, absolutely. And when you talk about the younger horses, breaking the horses, where does that happen? Do you outsource that as well or is that...? Yeah, well, as I said, Andrew really takes care of okay. everything. So that's done down in his end of the woods. And uh, 
then the horses come up for me to assess and uh, I'm in the process of selling them. I don't, you know, for, for us, okay, it'd be nice to really keep one that you bred and maybe we will someday, but I want to make the thing work as a business yes. and uh, and that's, that's, that's what we're doing. But it certainly doesn't really, doing the four-year-olds or three-year-olds, it's different, it's a different uh, stage and what we're doing yes. all together. So I tend not really to want to bring that to Carlswood. And we're here in your beautiful home in Blackhall Manor. Um, you're saying you you have a yard at the back. It's not it's not quite ready yet. But tell me what your plans are for the future for this um, place. Yeah, we moved here uh, last December, and uh, we're very lucky. We've got seventy acres, a uh, great big house, and and we're going to build a stables and and a training facility here. The plans are quite extensive. We're gonna, I'm going to build a gallop, mm -hmm. uh, two outdoors arena, uh, two outdoor arenas, finish the indoor arena, uh, which is already there and uh, have apartments for, for, for students and staff and that kind of thing. So I suppose I want to build around 30 stables and uh, people can come and train, stay here for, for stints and uh, compete, go to shows with us. So not again, not into huge numbers, trying to do it well. Yeah. No, no aspiration to run shows or anything like that, okay. but, but to have a good training facility where, where people can come and, and, uh, and learn both, both the horse and the rider. And when you mentioned actually training facility there, um, Abbottstown is a new training facility that Horseport Ireland have kind of got involved in and you've been quite involved with it as well. Tell us a little bit about that and I suppose what you think of the facility. Yeah, well there's many uh, sports under the one area there in, in, uh, in Blanchardstown and they, they've done a wonderful job with the, with, the, uh, with the arena that they've built. It's in a wall garden, it's fantastic, it visually looks, looks amazing and um, hopefully it'll be used now and, and be used for training camps for all the underage teams and, and perhaps for the senior team before big occasions like championships or, or, or the RDS and, uh, and indeed for, for other riders throughout Ireland who, who, who have a need for it. I mean, it's, uh, it's a good facility. It's good to have somewhere else to go to yeah. apart from the, the already places that we know. And also it's good from a point of view of the proximity. It's easy to get to. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a good initiative all around and hopefully it works well. And you've actually ridden on the surface there. What did you think? Yeah, we were up there a few weeks ago. It was really good. I mean, it was just put in, so it's hard to know. But I mean, it's the the standard of the surface should be good. It's the same surface, I'm told, that was in Greenwich for the Olympics. So um, it looks really, really amazing. So as I said, it's great to have somewhere else to take horses. Yeah. And, uh, and the location of it is excellent. And when you mentioned um, fitness, Riding fitness, it is slightly different than any Absolutely. other fitness. Do you agree or how, like, how do you, without, say, riding 20 horses a day, is there any other way to get riding fit? Well, you could have, you could, you're right, you mean you could have guys that could, that could run a marathon and they'd mm. be knackered after doing a round of jumps, you know, so it's about, it's about being able to be, uh, I suppose, look at the diet and stuff, look at, yeah. your, look at your own weight, but also with, uh, you need to be riding a certain amount of horses a day that you're, that you're, that you're fit and that you're mm -hmm. able for it. And obviously with the good horses, you can't jump them so much at home. So uh, you have to have enough practice as well that you can still compete. Keen, if you're a gambling man, um, where do you see Ireland at WEG and then the Olympics? Yeah, well, I used to be a gambling man, but I don't have a bet anymore. Okay. Um, I suppose I don't like to, 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 to pray for things to happen. I like to make them happen. Okay. And uh, nothing's going to happen by chance. And uh, if, you know, if we're serious about feeling a team in Rio, we need to look at this year and where the results were quite good this year. I mean, we did some good things and finished mid-division or a little better and, and uh, had some very good individual results. But to, to if we want to go to the Olympic Games in Rio, we need to really seriously think how we can win medals. Yeah. WEG, and WEG sounds very far away. WEG is in Normandy, it's only 11 months away, it's not far. So, you know, buying seven-year-olds now is not going to help our cause. The boat will be gone and we won't be going to Rio okay. unless we get serious about getting a team there. And that means the people that are able to deliver at that level with their owners and with their with their uh, with the with the management need to need, need to try it somehow and say let's make a strategic sure. plan towards making it happen i mean i for one i'm thinking day and night how i want to make it happen yeah. and we can all only worry about ourselves and um, hopefully i'll have two or three options because with horses you never know what happens and and you need a you need a fallback if something if something goes wrong and uh, Weg in, in Normandy is certainly going to be a tough task, but if we can if we can get there in, in good shape, I think we can do a good job. Keen, you're going to be expecting your first child now in less than two weeks. How is your life going to change? Yeah, it's certainly very exciting. Uh, Ruth and I can't wait. Uh, she's getting a bit restless at the minute, but uh, hopefully all goes well. Um, I suppose it'll really change for the better. It's a it's a brand new brand new chapter in life and. This world that, that I live in and that I work in is, can be can be very very intense, and it's uh, it's great to have, I suppose, normality 
to come back home to and uh, especially on the bad days I'm sure it will, will really be something nice. Absolutely. Do you think you'll have to sl like change your plans a little bit, maybe concentrate on different shows than you might normally or how are you going to work it? Yeah, so what's kind of crept up for me now because of the sale of, of Blue Lloyd is that now I'm involved with helping Nikki and, and, and you know, helping her with her career. Mm -hmm. So that's January, February, March. I'll be based in, uh, in Florida and okay. Ruth and, and, and Baby hopefully will come. Okay. And, uh, and then we come back here for April and then the summer shows start May, June, July, mm -hmm. August and normally in Ireland. And okay. I tend not to do too much in the winter. Right. Uh, so I'm, as I say, I'm not doing 50 shows a year. Maybe I'm doing 20. And uh, it's quite good because you can manage it. If you do a show in Germany on a, on a Sunday, you can get a flight home yeah. and you can be here Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday before you have to go to the next show or perhaps a week off before the next show. So we tend to, to spread it out that it works quite well. Okay, exciting times. Ahead. Yeah, hopefully. What are your plans? Can you see yourself always competing or when it comes to like retirement, what way are you thinking? No, I don't think I'll compete, you know, for, for a hugely long time. I mean, I, I, I really enjoy it yeah. and I've got some, you know, I mean, I'd love to, I'd love to uh, be part of a team that could win a medal mm -hmm. at Olympic Games. I mean, I'd like to, I'd like to, uh, love to win the Grand Prix in Ac and, you know, you've got little goals that you'd like yes. to, you'd like to achieve. And um, well, then you've got to be realistic as well. You know, it's expensive to compete. It's, 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 uh, you're always on the road. It's not as, it's not as nice for family and so on. So. I suppose to find the balance. Um, I enjoy doing it the way I do it, and the challenge is always is finding good horses, and, and how to keep myself uh, technically efficient at the high level. How to be able to con constantly win classes, and when you get the opportunity, like to ride Blue Lloyd, to be able to take it and take it with both hands and, and pull it off like we did in Dublin. So it's a balance of trying to trying to stay fit, trying to stay on top of things, and also trying to have enough horsepower to keep you keep you going. Maybe when I'm finished, the coaching will be a part of it. Yeah. Um, I've done quite a little bit of work in the Middle East with coaching riders there. Uh, I really enjoy helping Nikki because she can ride at a very good level. Mm -hmm. She's very pleasant to teach and to work with, very decent people. So, you know, uh, that's a girl that's going to be in it for quite a long time. So that's something that will probably take up quite a bit of my time, uh, which, which I enjoy doing. Keen, thanks a million for having us here today. No worries, thank you.